All right, welcome back. In case you're just joining us, it's time for our conversation. Let's quickly take one of our guests first while we wait for others uh, to join us on Zoom. Chijoke Wabote is a partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers. He's joining me right now via Skype. Hello, Chijoke. Welcome again to the program. Um, hello, Nancy. Can you hear me? I yes, I can hear the, you. The issues initially. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you, Chijoke, for uh, joining us today. Now, from where we stopped last week, you know, we were talking about the essence of data. We were also talking about the essence of even how many of the practitioners pay taxes and all of that. So, so would they be asking me and you, perhaps, that our taxpayers to use our own tax money to bail them out and all of that? But that's another issue. But I, but I want you to expatiate on that uh, in continuation of where we stopped last week. Okay, uh, thanks, Nancy. And um, I see you have a, and good morning to everybody. I see you have a, a, a couple of other very strong professionals. So I hope nobody will shoot me down when I start talking <laughs> about the tax implications. But I'd say this for, you know, if you look at the industry, right, um, some of the information that uh, maybe someone like uh, Moses would give you from the um, uh, Cinema Exhibitors Association of Nigeria would be that. We've topped six billion um, naira in uh, box office uh, for last year, for instance. And if you then think about um, what would be the typical, um, let's assume a an effective tax rate of say seventeen percent or to twenty percent, you're looking at one point two billion of taxes that should have been paid on that revenue, right? So th the question is, how much of the revenue that is generated in this industry is actually subjected to tax either you know directly or indirectly and also how much uh, the players in the industry considering that uh, if you look at the industry a lot of the people are also freelancers so there's if you look at in terms of percentages right um you probably see that more than 50 percent of the players in the industry are informal yeah. SMEs or maybe freelancers who are actually, you know, just working by project. So how many of them would voluntarily also uh, pay their taxes, right, apart from what you would deduct at source? So if you use that as a basis, I guess the question then is, you know, other countries have used people's uh, revenue and taxes to actually justify being able to give palliatives or grants to people in this industry. So other countries have been able to use that data to do that. Now for Nigeria, for instance, you want to get a palliative from government, you want to get some funding from government. The, the thing is this, on what would be the basis to do that? For instance, if government asks you for your revenue for the past three years and your taxes for the past three years to say this would work, this would be what would qualify you to be able to um, take on this uh, palliative or this grant or this financing that we're going to give you. Would people be able to provide that relevant information, right? Um, another thing is, if you think about the information government is trying to get from the players in the industry around the impact of COVID-19 on their businesses, by the time, so people just need to be also be careful because by the time you say, oh, I have really suffered revenue loss of, say, 20 million in the past three months, right? That gives me a sense of the kind of earnings you have. So if I then ask you to give me evidence of taxes you paid, because if I use the run rate of your revenue now and I say you've made, you say you, your loss in the past three months is 20 million, I'll, I can then say, for instance, that your revenue in a year is probably what, anywhere from 60 to 80 million. I'll then ask, Last year, 2019, well, what taxes did you pay if you're telling me now that this is what your revenue loss is? So I think it's critical for us to also start looking at that, you know, the, the tax compliance aspect, because you're then able to then be able to come forward with a bit more uh, credibility and justification for financing from government. You know, so that's basically the point I was making. And I, and I think that this data gathering exercise now and i'm hoping that some of the questions they'll be asking will be things like your revenue loss right would then help government get a sense of the kind of revenue that people are making in this industry and then also confirm what kind of taxes that people should pay 
uh, for, for this um, data gathering, because that's a committee the government has put together uh, that is being chaired, I think, by Ali Baba, the uh, veteran comedian. Uh, how do you okay. think that data should be gathered? Because even f from last week, all of you were on the same page in terms of data is needed. Data is needed in this industry. We, we even have a death of data, even in the country. Do you understand? For example, if I want to say now, okay, I want to get data of how many pregnant women are in Nigeria right now. I don't even know if we can get that. As simple as that. Do you understand what I'm saying? So absolutely. Um, so I uh, so what I I do know that they have adopted a survey method and they've um, sent out a, a simple Google sh uh, Google form where they've asked people to fill in information. Right? Um, you know, I think. You know that's that is a simplistic way of doing it. Um, you know, rather you know, just putting it out there and asking people to kind of fill the information. But I think, you know, and it's it's it, it could be effective as well. But I think we should also be um, very structured with the kind of questions we're asking, and um, you know, just to be sure that we're getting the right kind of information from these individuals. Some people are already within, uh, I mean, some people who are SMEs who are already registered businesses, it would be kind of easy to also kind of, um, as you're extracting that data, compare it to what they have, uh, they've had before. But really, it's, I think, in the first instance, the, the surveys they've issued, I think, would help at least to gather some uh, primary data. But I think it's more of what have you put in the surveys? What kind of information are you going to elicit from the surveys? So it's not just saying, for instance, um, uh, what do you want from government? Obviously, everybody would say, I want money, you know. But it's, it should also help to get a bit more information around, you know, what kind of work do you do? What, you know, what sector do you play? You know, what, um, what are the... Uh, you know, what is your staff strength uh, if, um, in terms of projects you're working on, you know, the size of the projects. So just information that would not just help us because we, we can't be, we can't be, um, what's the word? We can't be just reacting to this situation, but this is, should also help us plan for the longer term, right? So I think this is a very good opportunity for us to kind of get that very, you know, um, credible data for the industry. So I think in, this, in terms of the surveys, let's even start with the surveys. Even though the question I'd ask is this, how wide is this survey, right? Like I said, a lot of people are freelancers. So for instance, are the freelancers getting this? Because one thing you would find out, and this is not just Nigeria, this is a general issue that you have in terms of trying to gather data on this industry, is that you'd find out that you'd go to the people you know, or you'd go to the, you'd go to the people you think, um, you know, which should be able to get this information, you should be able to get this information from. But there are a significant number of people that are outside your circle of, of contacts or the, the people or the circle of contacts of everybody within the, um, you know, the, the, the project team that need to be able to get this information. So how, how have we publicized, for instance, the uh, data gathering exercise? You know, how well have we spread out that information? Has the government also supported this committee in helping to spread this information, put it on the national news, um, put it on the national dailies, make sure that people are aware that there is a data gathering exercise and you need to provide this level of data to the committee. So I'm not sure I've seen enough of that, to be honest, and uh, I might be wrong, but um, from what you would expect to have, you know, I, I don't know, Nancy, have you heard of a data gathering exercise, for instance? Because if it's something that's out there, people should know. People should know that they should feel this information. No, I, like I said earlier, that this sector, the entertainment sector, the creative sector, is an industry with so much value chain. You've also said freelancers. You also have even the direct jobs and all of that. Along this value chain, which do you think has been hit the most by this COVID-19 <laughs> impact? Is that a hard question to answer? <laughs> uh, to, to be honest, so everybody has been hit hard and everybody would make a case for how hard they've been hit. But I think what we should be doing in, in terms of our impact analysis as well is to determine everybody will be hit differently. I think that's the way to put it. Everybody will be hit differently. 
you know, and we need to kind of understand the impact for everybody. So we have to say we can't do a one size fits all. There will be loss in revenue. We all do understand there will be loss in revenue. But the question is, you know, what are, are there any mitigating, um, you know, measures that we could take for some of these guys and uh, some of the people within the value chain? And let me be honest. People who are working on a project to project, on a project by project basis, they are not able to make money. And it's, that's just it. If their projects are not happening, they can't make money. The employees, for instance, of a uh, big, uh, I'll take a cinema, for instance, right? They, the cinema will be hard hit because they're not making money. They're, op they're, they're all shut, right? So everybody is impacted. One is impacted. It's revenue. There's a revenue impact for everybody. And I'd, I wouldn't stick my neck out to say this person has been hardest hit because they all have, you know, they're all, they're all losing revenue. Everybody's losing revenue right now. I know everybody's talking about online, that there are some people that are actually able to put their content online. I keep saying this. YouTube, Facebook, there's a whole, a huge amount of free content on YouTube. There's a huge amount of free content on Facebook. And, you know, people are spoiled for choice, you know, on YouTube and the rest. So, in fact, like Facebook recently had to even start looking at ways of being able to monetize people's pages. Like if, you're, if you have a Facebook Live event, you should be able to try and monetize it. So it's easy to say, oh, the people online are making a killing. How many, how many films can go to Netflix, for instance? How many films can Netflix take at a certain time? How many can they license? So everybody has revenue losses. And um, if you bring anybody in any of the different parts of the value chain, they'll tell you how badly they are hit. But I think the general thing is this, we're all losing revenue right now. Mm. Losing, losing revenue. And I wonder where the, I wonder where um, the palliatives will come from. And if, as, because everyone is asking for a palliative. And if government, Absolutely. yes, if government even has the financial muzzle uh, to give the palliatives, that's on one hand. The other hand also is that the entertainment sector, at least in the country, is one sector that went off on its own. That is one sector filled with so much in innovation and inventiveness that went ahead to start developing even without government's effort. So, for example, if government does not give the palliatives or the intervention, can that sector also survive and navigate its way through uh, this uh, hard waters or through this storm? Uh, to be honest, Nancy, nobody was. There's nobody in this world that's prepared uh, for the coronavirus and the impact of the coronavirus. So I'd say that um, in the past, uh, yes, uh, the industry has grown with um, uh, minimal government support. But if you look at the the situation we're facing now, nobody has. There's no template. There's no playbook, right? So. Tell it, 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 it's it's simple. You it's it's a it's a it's a it's an industry that requires a significant amount of human interaction. I mean, you talk about people, the performers. You feed from your crowd. You you want to uh, produce a movie. You need people to come together to act. It's an industry that requires contact. It's um you know a lot of people talk about technology and the and what technology is going to do. To the, the industry, but at the end of the day, it's, I think it's one of those industries that, in terms of its production, technology, it's human interactions that kind of drive this. So, huh? if we're looking at can this, uh, can we do it without government intervention? Sure. That is a definite no-no. Even if you go to the more developed countries uh, around the world, all of them are getting financing from their governments. And let's let's be clear on that. You know, go to Europe. The different countries, Italy, France, they all put in, they all put in funding into the cultural and creative industries. And just for you to know that, if you think about it, I dare say that you know it's an essential service. Whether if, if you think of, if you think about um, sitting at home and not having anything to watch, and you know I have people kind of you know putting together a playlist for every weekend that oh this is my Netflix playlist or this is my ah there's this Nigerian movie that I never knew about and everything if you think about the fact that this is an industry that has actually helped a lot of us get through the real dark days of of the shutdown 
So I dare say that we can say that we're also essential because from a mental health standpoint, you'd go crazy without entertainment in this period that we're sitting at home. Yeah. So that's why you can actually boldly then go back to government and say, we do need to be funded one way or the other because that's what every other person is doing. Actually, South Africa, the Department of Arts and Culture for South Africa, they did a very, in fact, they did a three-month study and impact analysis on the industry. If you think about what we're doing here, I think the committee was given four weeks to gather this information. These guys did, I think it was March, April, and May. It was three months. They took their time to get information for the respondents, to review the information and get to a point where they were able to publish a study about the economic impact analysis on the industry. Right, and they are, and you know they are also doing things around funding. How do we okay. fund the industry, and how do we create you know ways for them to do it? So, just in summary, I do not think the industry at this point is resilient enough to mm. survive on its own without funding and government intervention. Okay, I think we'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you, Chidi. Okay, let's quickly take a break to bring in other guests. But I like the point which you said in terms of even on the lockdown. The entertainment sector uh, really brought in some kind of sanity because a lot of people were going crazy. But we watch films, you listen to music and all of that. Just check out yesterday when Liverpool or Liverpool FC, the whole social media went <laughs> crazy. I'm an Arsenal fan. I'm an Arsenal fan. You know, you know, no, no, I'm not, I'm not an Arsenal fan. I'm a Chelsea fan, let's put it there. And I also watch Nigerian football, so Nigeria shouldn't come after me, you know. But you understand what I mean. So that, that sector is needed. All right, let's quickly take a break to connect with the others. When we come back, we'll continue to chat uh, about uh, the COVID-19 impact on the entertainment sector. We'll be right back. Uh, he spoke to me earlier before uh, both of you joined me. And he did say that about six billion was spent last year in the cinema industry. So how much have, have you and your colleagues lost like in the last three to four months? Okay, thank you for that. Uh, so Chidoke, okay, good friend, his, his assumptions are right, or his, his assertions are right. We generated about $6.4 billion last year in ticket sales. Mm. Now, in, in, put, in contextualizing this for, for, for cinemas, we, we, we estimate the amount of losses beyond ticket sales. So the cinema business comprises in terms of revenue streams, comprises of the ticket sales, and then the um, um, food revenues, popcorn, drinks, shawarma, hot dogs, that, that's a significant revenue for um, cinema businesses. Then you have advertising, you have activations and all that kind of stuff. What also propels cinemas are big tempo, big blockbuster films. So if you think that, like I analyzed before, we've lost money from middle February, where we have had the Valentine's session. We've not had any Easter holiday because we've been locked down or shut down. We've not had the benefit of the Muslim holidays uh, because we've been at home. We've missed all the blockbusters from James Bond to Black Widow to Fast and Furious, which have all been moved to the Nigerian big films. That number is anywhere between five billion, between four and five billion for the cinema sector. Uh, because we, we also factor in a, 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 a good number as well, you know, for, for this uh, time of the year. So, uh, I mean, from middle of February till now, it's anywhere between four and five billion from the cinema sector alone. Uh, the wider film sector, of course, is it, 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 running into the tens of billion. Mm. And just stick with you a bit. Um, if you just hold on a bit, let me still ask uh, uh, Moses uh, this uh, question because uh, social distancing, fiscal distancing may just be with us uh, for quite a while. And I don't know how much of that would impact uh, the cinemas. And perhaps what kind of lift is expected for the sector, even? as we move from this lockdown uh, to perhaps the economy reopening fully and perhaps safely opening? So one of the things that we've been doing well, and it, it, please allow me to um, introduce the Cinema Exhibitors Association of Nigeria. I think it's been the platform for us to come as a, uh, as a sector with, uh, and, and as, as a group of you know, professionals to represent the cinema industry and speaking as, with one voice you know, to the various stakeholders and particularly the government, to say there is a way we can open responsibly and responsibly to our, uh, you know, singing audiences that want to have a good time. We, we accept that the new normal will be that safety protocols have got to be put in place. We totally understand that. And that's why as an association, we are almost mandating our members 
to follow the protocols that have been put in by the NCDC and the various, you know, health agencies. But as, as an association, there are minimum things that we're looking to uh, put in place. So, for example, you know, as, across our screens, we're saying no more than 50% capacity. We're saying that no mask, no entry. We're saying, you know, sanitizers, you know, or even automated ones at various points in the cinemas. We're saying that our staff are duly trained properly. Uh, we're minimizing uh, contact. Things that just ensure that our audiences feel safe you know, in the environment. And we think that we can put an experience around this. But then, I think once we put into the consciousness of, you know, our, our customers that they, they can watch the best films in the safest environment, you know, it's, it's the new normal we face, but I guess it makes us have more responsible and uh, safety-conscious businesses. Okay. But we're prepared for those kind of protocols, and we just hope that we can engage more with the government to know that we've been shot... The longer we are short, it's not good for a new ecosystem. That is but are you engaging with them are, are now, or you're waiting for them to call on you guys to engage? We are engaging with them. I would okay. have to say they've been also responsive. The Lagos State government have been very progressive in terms of their re-registering uh, 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 process that they've put in place. There are several meetings that have been held. Uh, the federal government, as you know, has constituted a committee that have sent in their mm -hmm. reports. We will also engage with the Edo State Government and I think the Delta State Government. Okay. And, that, and it's, it's good to see that the government are looking at the big picture and kind of prioritizing the creative sector. As we know what's going on in the oil sector, you know, you can't afford to continue to prioritize a sector that you're not very sure of its future. Okay. This, the creative sector, particularly film sector, we know what, what, what holds. There's a lot of talent here. Okay. So we're happy that there's engagement. We just want, you know, action now. Okay, Moses, I'll come back to you. If your Rugby is also uh, with you on this panel, with me too, uh, if he's the chief executive of SAT Now Music Entertainment, if you've heard what Moses just said about what the new normal will be in the industry, what will be the new normal in your own industry? Or how, or how will thing. it look like? It's, it's basically the same thing. Um, music uh, uh, and my industry is pretty expansive. Uh, because sometimes when people say music industry, uh, probably eight out of ten times you just see the the performing artists, the stars, you know, the guys who are doing the singing. Uh, but it's it's an entire ecosystem. There are songwriters, there are producers, there are musicians, there are technical people, you know, there are production people from lights to cameras to screens, you know, the event venues, and a lot of this. Of a drive, you know, is driven by, by by the music that you know that is created and the music that is performed. So uh, uh, the people, we, I commend very very highly what uh, what uh, the the cinema guys are doing. Uh, uh, they they have there's basically setting a tone for for the other parts of the industry, the other segments to to borrow heavily from. Uh, the, we have to work with the government. The government has to work with us. A lot of these venues uh, would have to be uh, reopened. Business would have to re restart, but in a way that minimizes the the uh, negative impact of, of of COVID. In the way, in a way that also ensures that uh, there's there's really really limited you know uh, transmission possibilities around around all of this. Okay. If a, just a very quick one, before I also move over to Moses, is the nighttime economy. Um, in Lagos, for example, the nighttime is quite vibrant. The nighttime economy commands so much money, uh, which also your industry, because you see a lot of shows being done in the night, you know, and all of that. The night, the night, the night is our day. Yes. Uh, for for yes, the night is our day. Most most talents, you know, if you if you know how it, it really functions, a lot of artists, uh, uh, music industry people, uh, particularly the performance, they are they, they sleep all day and they work all night. So with the nighttime economy being hampered now, and perhaps even as we go into the new normal, uh, perhaps coffees will still be existing even in the night. So how does your industry cope with this? Very quickly before I come to Moses to conclude the show. Hard, it's hard to, to uh, put, put into context how it copes. People are really, really badly hit. Um, economically, psychologically, 
I do not even know there should even be some some kind of intervention at the level of, of mental health management and all of that. It's it's nobody's fault per se, but it's everybody's responsibility to mm -hmm. design a safe and secure response and reactivation plan. If this lockdown continues, if the if the the uh, uh, curfews continue, you know, then it, it will just it will just keep multiplying the negative effects of mm -hmm. of of the COVID-19 okay. uh, pandemic. Okay, very quickly, um, Moses, just in 30 seconds, if you can. Uh, when I was taking a look at the data and how much the cinemas have been commanding, I see that Nigerians spend a lot more watching foreign movies. Yeah, okay, for, right. for, foreign movies, yes. And now that everyone is hit with the COVID-19 pandemic, most of the foreign movies are not into, or most producers are not even producing right now. How do you intend to cope with that? Because Nigerian movies follow the foreign movies. For example, I think I was taking a look at Aquaman, Angel Has Fallen, and all of that. So how do you intend to do that? Because if there's no production, there's nothing for you to show on the screen, even including Nigerian movies. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I have to say, and I'll try, like you said, 30 seconds. Uh, look, that's a real concern in terms of having content pipeline to show in the cinema. Thankfully, we've been able to secure a number of films, you know, for the rest of the year that have been affected by this uh, slowdown. We, we think that we were able to fill in the slate to the end of the year, but it's what happens after the end of the year that is the real risk for us in terms of local content. Okay. We're, we're hopeful that there'll be protocols in place very soon, mm. that as long as we represent to the government, government that, you know, we can produce films safely. I'm okay. hopeful that in the next few months we'll see production activity start happening. I think it's already happening, but, but there's no real protocol around how it should be. Okay. Uh, but let's hope there's no second wave. Uh, we, 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 it's a risk, but we hope that we can uh, mitigate it. Thank you very much, Moses. I want to thank you uh, for the three of you, because Chijoke was also on this panel, you know. Thank you very much, Moses, for speaking with me today. Moses is the co-founder, Film House Group. Thank you, Efeo Morogbe. You joined us last week. You also joined us again today. Chief Executive of Sanao Music Entertainment. Thank you very much, guys. Chijoke, Wagbote, Partner, Pricewaterhouse. Thank you. Cooper has also joined us. Thank you very much, guys.